Yeah, so I'm Andrew Ziegler um, from Georgia Tech, and I'm doing PhD there, so I'm still a student. Um, but before that, I was doing my master's degree at UCSD with Surge, and what we worked on was uh, applying vision to uh, assistive reading devices. And <clears throat> to start off, so this talk's gonna be kind of a mix of what we did and some speculation as to what could be done with what we know now. So to start off, I'm gonna kind of a, give a little survey of assistive reading technology. So actually the last talk that we saw, um, I should have added a slide for it here, um, <clears throat> but I didn't know about it until now. <laughs> so here's something that's uh, been out for a while now called the Intel Reader. So this is Intel's assistive reading technology. And essentially what we have here is, a, I think it's about, uh, I don't know, like this big if you can see my hands. And what we have is there's a little screen and some buttons and a camera on the bottom. And the principle is the same as uh, the text detective in that you're gonna try to take a picture of some text and then have it read aloud to you. All right, and there's also another device um, that's been around for a long time but then has been converted to like a phone app is the KNFB Reader. Um, so this is actually, I think, sponsored by the National Federation for the Blind. And um, <clears throat> essentially it does the same thing. You take a picture with the phone, and I think my slides are going automatically. We just pause them. You know how to get, oh, here we go. There we go. So, right, so with these devices though, there's an issue, right, this pointing problem. Like how do I actually capture the text? Especially if I'm blind or low vision, how am I supposed to take a picture of the text? One way is to maybe drive somebody, right? Like maybe you can have some kind of uh, haptic feedback, you know, like I've detected text, move the phone here, or take a video and select the best frame, right? Um, <clears throat> well, another option would actually be to take that continuous video and reconstruct the surface of this thing. So that's actually kind of what we were moving towards. So before I get there though, I wanted to explain what egocentric vision is. So when we started on this project, um, I don't think egocentric vision was really coined yet, but now we see it all the time. Like several of you are wearing Google Glass right now. So this would fall under the category of egocentric vision, which essentially puts a camera at your perspective. So anything that I see, the camera can see. <clears throat> and the really nice thing about this, and on the right-hand side here, is a new company called uh, OrCam. Some of you may have heard of this, and it's uh, <clears throat> similar. Like it has some reading capabilities, but also navigation, so you can check like if uh, street light's green or not. But the neat thing about egocentric vision for the visually impaired is that it allows you to free up your hands, first of all, Right now the camera's on my face, so I can use my hands. And <clears throat> the other thing is it takes advantage of proprioception, right? Even if you can't see what you're trying to take a picture of, you could hold it in front of your face pretty easily because you know where your hand is, right? And you can feel how big the thing is. So essentially, if you're gonna imagine like a finished product, we don't have this, but if you're gonna imagine something finished, this is maybe the interaction that you'd have if you wanted to read something you haven't seen before is maybe I would pick the thing up and just kind of move left and right like this. And this is actually pretty easy to do. And then the idea is that you could stitch all that together using some um, pretty mature computer vision techniques and essentially make like a panorama. And from that, you would have all the text. So all of a sudden this pointing problem is uh, not such a big issue once you put the camera on your face. Another neat thing about egocentric vision is some problems become easier. So hand segmentation, particularly if you want to use a gestural interaction, now we can do that a little bit easier in object detection in some cases. So on the next slide, I have some examples of egocentric vision. Um, <clears throat> here is like an obstacle course, uh, first person view, and then you've got this idea of a GoPro. So egocentric vision has kind of been coming into the mainstream, especially with Google Glass. And over here on the left is an example of um, some work that was actually done at Georgia Tech by one of my uh, fellow students that just finished. And what he was able to do for his thesis is actually detect things like your hands and objects that you're interacting with and the egocentric view made this problem easier. So some people actually accused his problem of being too easy um, because all of a sudden he could do things like segment hands and identify objects fairly quickly and, and reliably. And part of the reason is because you know where the person's going to look. And typically when somebody's interacting with their hands, they look at their hands. So you have some type of prior on where the hand should be, which makes it a little bit easier to segment them. And maybe uh, you have a lexicon of objects that you're gonna be interacting with. <clears throat> So I want to talk about this for a little bit. OrCam was kind of exciting to see because what we were working on, we were trying to lead up to something like this and then to see a company come out with a fully working product, we were like, hey, cool, our idea works. Somebody else came up with it too. I wonder if they knew about what we did or not. Um, <clears throat> but essentially, you can kind of see what they've got. They have this special hardware glasses with a camera. I don't know what else is going on and here's their computer. And essentially, you can go watch their video on their website. Uh, they have a good uh, advertisement. Essentially, what you can do with this is, um, read things. So I'm not quite sure how they do it, but maybe this Aleve, they do 
template recognition and then they can tell you about this uh, or memorize the directions on the back and just read them out loud to you. Or if you're reading a newspaper or a menu or something, the kind of interaction they have is you hold your finger out in front of you, wherever this text is, and then it's going to read to you what's underneath your finger. There's not very good pointing precision. I'm not quite sure what they're doing internally, but essentially from what I've seen it can say, your finger's on top of like part of an article of a newspaper, let's read that one. Okay. So part of what we did is try to give people fine grain precision. So I want to talk a little bit about what you do when you're designing reading technology, especially from this egocentric point of view, right? Well, first of all, things like the Intel Reader or KNFB Reader or other um, reading devices that are based on somebody taking a picture, right, is not that accessible to the visually impaired because, first of all, you have to figure out where you're aiming and then you have to touch tiny buttons and a lot of the times the feedback is given to you on a tiny display. And so this might be good for people who have low vision, but as you um, <clears throat> lose more sight, this becomes less accessible. Another interesting thing about this uh, design is that, how do you want to interact with this? If you're gonna replace the buttons, maybe we want to use our hands. And especially if the camera's on my face, all of a sudden it frees up my hands to naturally interact with something so I can start holding the paper that I want to read. <clears throat> and then there's this other point about video versus a still image. Right? If I use video, I can use some pretty mature geometric techniques that work well to reconstruct um, this paper and get like a full picture of it. So all of a sudden you don't have to worry about trying to find the view or things being skewed. So that becomes a problem later, but say this thing was perfectly flat, it would work pretty well. Now, on the other end of things, you need to have a way to recognize the text, right? So the, the most basic way would be if I just took a picture of this, I'd want to hold the camera like pretty, um, I guess, fronto parallel, so there's no real foreshortening or distortion going on here, right? If I hold this, the text kind of uh, gets distorted from your perspective. If I take a picture of that, and it's a pretty good one that OCR can work, and the last talk was all about making OCR better, so I'm hoping that people will make it really work well. Um, <clears throat> but when warp text comes into play, you have to do something special to deal with it. So like people know how to correct for foreshortening pretty easily, um, but some other things like curving paper, right? If I have like a curved paper or a crinkly newspaper or something like that, it gets a little bit trickier. And then there's other techniques besides OCR, like spotting words in the wild, use some like, machine learning to find signs and things like that. We're only interested in the problem of paper, like text printed on paper. And there's some special things that happen when you have text printed on paper that I'll talk about. And another option, so this is something that occurred to us later on because we found about some new technology that I'll talk about. So you can actually search through a database of templates pretty efficiently. So if I just take one picture, even if it's occluded, like not a full picture of the text, text is generally made in the computer nowadays. If I just had that PDF in the database, I could pull it up and then read that to you. <coughs> Let's talk about that a little bit more. So this is a point that I want to make is hardware versus software. When we were designing this thing, our goal was how could we make a reading device that's affordable and massively available, right? If you have OrCam or the Intel Reader, KNFB Reader, the prices are pretty high. And this comes from needing to produce custom hardware and advertising, make a profit, right? There's not that many people to sell this to. So um, volume could help, but it's hard to get your foot in that door. Um, <clears throat> so why not just distribute the software instead? So that would be like using these iPhones that people already have, but then that defeats this egocentric view that I've been emphasizing. So how can we deal with that? The way that we did it is we hot glued a webcam to some ski goggles <laughs> um, and used a laptop. And, uh, the idea here is that a webcam can be jerry-rigged to go on your face pretty easily. And this right here, we got the goggles for free and the webcam for free, so actually it was free. <laughs> the, the styrofoam head cost $8. Um, <clears throat> so another interesting thing about this is it, since we started working on this in 2010, a lot of things have happened. And one thing that happened is 3D printers are coming all over the place, right? There's these maker bots, like all of a sudden people can produce things out of plastic pretty easily. And if you're gonna go large scale, injection molding's been around for a long time, you can make a cheap mold. And basically what, what I'd imagine is take the webcam, the shape of it, you download the mold in your 3D printer, print it out, or get the plastic injected one from the company, snap your webcam in, now you can put it on your face and it doesn't look so ugly. <laughs> Wearing ski goggles everywhere. Um, so that's, that's kind of our dream was to have this, download the software, put it on your face, and start reading. So here's an example of the two prototypes that we had. One is just a single camera here. Um, and then the one on the left here, so this kind of looks weird. We actually started working on this project before Connect came out. And so I had to make my own Connect. So that's what this thing on the left here is. 
essentially um, there's a webcam up on the top and there's this little Pico projector on the side and it operates on the same principles as the Kinect, it's just a little bit slower and clunkier. Um, but you could replace this sort of thing with a Kinect. So using this structured light technique you can get 3D geometry and I'll talk about why that's important later. I thought I'd throw this in there. I saw this and uh, other people are doing this too. And earlier today, right, we saw like a lanyard with a connect around uh, the chest. So people do this sort of things. The laptop, thankfully, can be replaced by phones because they're pretty powerful now, <laughs> or I hope. Or if you have something like Google Glass, if that ever caught on or something like it, you could imagine using that hardware instead. But before that happens, maybe people can buy these webcams and glue them on their head. <clears throat> So the other thing I want to talk about, there are two things I want to talk about now, um, and this is what we did. So these are some things that we actually tried, some proof of concept. Two problems we wanted to, count, uh, to tackle. One is how do I interact with text, especially if I'm visually impaired, what can I do? And then the second thing was how do we deal with warped text if there's not a template? Three minutes? Three, okay. Um, so <coughs> what we did is we take this method called non-rigid surface detection, and essentially what it does is it tracks an actively deforming surface if you have a template. And uh, what's neat about this is that you can have very fine pointing control. And so we ended up using this technique, which is originally meant to augment a surface, to tell us where a user's pointing. So like on the right side here, maybe the video stream sees this warped paper, and as you're touching it, we can actually use this known template to figure out where you're touching on the flattened piece of paper. And so that gives you basically a GUI. And so all of a sudden, your piece of paper becomes like a traditional computer and mouse. And so you can imagine there's endless possibilities, right? You can go make any type of app you want, highlight text. For sighted people, you could even get some advertising money, touch on some celebrity's face, pull up their website on glass, um, <coughs> those sorts of ideas. So I'll go through this kind of fast. Here's an example of what you could do with this, right? I have the template on the left here, and this mesh is how we're doing this. Um, now when I touch this can to see what's under my finger, I can actually find that pretty precisely and then do some predetermined action. Another example is maybe you have a map, right, and you want to figure out where you're going. So I have some videos, but I'll skip them. So if you'd like to see these, you can come talk to me. This is just an example of it working. I cheated. I used green tape. Um, but you can find the hands now. And we had this idea that you could gesture, like select something. So I'm going to skip this video. If you want to see it, you can come talk to me. Because I have some other things to say. And this was this original purpose, um, some augmented reality. So that platypus isn't really there. That's what they originally made this up for. We used it for gestures. So here's my last two points, I guess, is that one, everything's made in a computer now. If we have the template, then we can just look it up in a database. Okay, and so here's a recent paper came out like a year or two ago, and essentially they're able to search through millions of PDFs and find like a match. And the idea is even from an occluded view, partial view, you can just pull that up. Now I know the template, now you can apply this gestural interaction and all of a sudden you don't need to do OCR. You already know the answer because you made the PDF. So this could even work for like restaurants, menus, you just have to have a system in place for people to upload their templates. And this all blazed through and people can ask me about later, is what about when a template's not available? Well, paper printed on, uh, or text printed on paper actually has some special properties because paper, something called an applicable surface, it gives us all these neat mathematical tricks we can do. And essentially, you can de-warp text if you know the 3D model of this or something else about it. So I have this quick example. Here I've got this blue kind of curvy thing. And essentially, you can think of that as like a folded piece of paper. And so I've generated this, and it's just sparse points to represent it. And we can fit a plane and do a little bit of trickery to um, fit this thing and relax this into what's called the applicable state. And using that, you can actually back project to de-warp this thing. So all of a sudden you take warped text and you get the flat version. So then you could actually run your OCR and it would work better. So here's an example of doing that. And this was a method we adapted from 2001. And you can see on the left, there's this warped curved text and on the right, it's straighter. Um, near the edges, it doesn't work as well, but you can see that this is definitely straighter than over there. So the conclusion, so I made it to the end. Um, <coughs> for wide impact, the thing that I think should happen next is we should be software-based, you know, no custom hardware, wait for Google Glass or something like that to come out, or use webcams and 3D printers. Use the templates when possible, because why well, try to figure out a hard problem when you already know the answer, right? It's like cheating. Um, and uh, the other thing that we need is a, a way to allow people to upload their templates, right? Like if I'm owning a restaurant or making a newspaper or magazine or something, I just want to upload my PDF to the database so people can have access. 
And the emphasis of this really is the egocentric view. It makes a lot of things easier. So um, here's some links, and uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Andrew. Thank you, sir. Thanks, uh, Ilk from University of Santa Um I really like this approach of like going from like a handheld view to an egocentric view. But do you think in the future maybe you could even push it further? It's like uh, you know when you play first-person shooter game, you have a first-person shooter, third-person view. Mm -hmm. So maybe you could do like a quad rotor or something with a GoPro oh. <laughs> and just like you know see the whole scene. Sure, but. Um I guess that there would have to be a way for the visually impaired person to control the helicopter. Or... No, 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 it's, it's still cheaper than can, can a be reader. Okay. Reader. No problem. Yeah. No, I mean, that's, that's possible. I, I could imagine something like that. And you don't have to walk it like a know. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Jeff. Actually, remind people where you are, Jeff. Yeah, but I have to remind myself sometimes. So Jeff um, from uh, CMU, I'll say. Um, so really cool stuff. Uh, I was wondering if you had thought about um, kind of using a partial match from the OCR to mm -hmm. say, do a Google search for the document and use that as your um, template. They do that at Google. There oh. <laughs> <laughs> you go. <laughs> okay, one more question. Is that it? Okay, let's thank Andrew again. Thank